Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the leadership panel discussion this morning and to a lovely autumn day in Bozeman. <laughs> I hope those of you from New Mexico packed accordingly. We're not treating you very kind here, but <laughs> my name is Teresa Snyder, and I have had ample opportunities during my college career to practice leadership here on the campus of Montana State University. Uh, last year, I served as the student body president while earning a degree in economics and I'm currently studying um, towards a master's in public administration while serving as a student regent on the Montana Board of Regents of Higher Education. Um, as we're about to inaugurate the 12th president of Montana State University, it's a most appropriate time to have this prominent panel of executives discussing the topic of leadership. I am honored to have been asked to introduce these featured guests, and I, like you, am looking very forward to what they have to say. So for the time being, go ahead and refer to their bios in the, uh, in the folder that you're given at the door, and I'll just go ahead and give them quickly introducing them by name. So first we have the Honorable Governor of the State of Montana, Governor Brian Schweitzer. Next, we have the CEO of Ray Howe North America, Kitty Saylor. <laughs> and the president of the University of Idaho, Dwayne Nellis. The superintendent of public education for the state of Montana, Denise Juno. And of course, our moderator, the superintendent of public schools in Bozeman, Montana, Dr. Kirk Miller. <laughs> and of course, what is probably of most important note is that all of these panelists, our moderator, as well as myself, are all MSU alumni. So I <laughs> I think it's safe to say that MSU set students up for great career success. So <laughs> I will turn it over to the panel. Ter Teresa, thank you so much for your introduction. And um, I would like to recognize Teresa as she served as an outstanding student leader here at MSU uh, and has now uh, assumed her position on the Montana Board of Regents. And uh, we look forward to your great, great effort and leadership skills um, helping our board make decisions for the future. I also would like to begin with a thank you to Kathy Conover and Chelsea Schmidt who have done just wonderful work and a whole committee of people who have worked diligently um, to assemble a group of people who are here today uh, and to have um, this event, this starting event of what is to be a wonderful day um, get underway uh, and that we can get all voices into the room. So I'd like to recognize Kathy and Chelsea. Empowering people, transforming the world. That's the theme of what we're about with our land-grant university here at Montana State University. Leadership can be defined as causing people to go places they would not have gone on their own or not gone ordinarily. That's from the International Center on Leadership and Education. And I can tell you that we have a wonderful opportunity today by gathering these power, this group of four powerful leaders um, as they have direct ties to Montana State University and have created scenarios, created, created life skills um, that in many cases began right here with our land-grant university. And I just have to tell you that I'm proud of the quality and I'm proud to be seated at, seated at the table with you, you four individuals, and I thank you for being here today. I had the opportunity to interview several of our panel members, and I can tell you I valued their leadership story and their background. The true challenge today for me as the moderator will be to create a gracious space and get everybody's voice into the room because the stories are genuine and they are, and they are striking. Uh, so I want to have that happen and I'm gonna get us started right away. Panelists, thank you so much for being here and sharing your experiences with us, and I'm gonna get right to the point and get, and get going. Our first question that I would like to pose for you is, would you share an experience with us that has supported or contributed to you as a leader today? And I'd like to begin, first of all, with Superintendent Juno. Um, 
and get your voice in the room. All right, well, thank you very much. And it is also an honor to be on this panel with such distinguished guests and to really be at Montana State University for the installation of a new president, which I'm very, very honored to um, be friends and colleagues with Dr. Cruzado and um, how important this inauguration is for the first woman and first minority, particularly for the state of Montana, for a president to be leading a university system in Montana. I'm just very proud to be a part of it. Um, as far as leadership and uh, an experience, and I can tie this actually to this university and how important the, this university has been to where I sit today. I mean, I never ever thought I would be in such a position as a superintendent of public instruction. I grew up in Browning, Montana, on the Blackfeet Reservation, a uh, graduate from Browning High School. And while I was here, so it was very different coming from Browning to Montana State University and getting acclimated to the atmosphere here and, and, and getting adjusted. I, had, I made some great friends here. Um, I met some great people. I think I got a qu very quality education. Um, but I can remember back exactly to one day when I was walking in the College of Letters and Science down the hallway and I saw a flyer on the wall just posted there uh, talking about um, a Rockefeller Brothers Fellowship for minorities entering the teaching profession. And that's what I was doing here. I was getting a degree in English um, in secondary education. And so I inquired about it. Um, and being the only American Indian in the English department was actually pretty easy because I th felt the flyer was just for me, probably. Um, <laughs> so I inquired about it, but I, I, you know, was able to make connections and relationships with the faculty in that department. They took me under their wing. They prepped me. They interviewed me. They helped me to write my personal statements. Um, I got to go to New York City for the first time and be interviewed by the committee for, for the big fellowship. And those faculty actually helped me to receive that, um, that fellowship, which then led to an entire series of events, such as having the confidence to apply for the Harvard Graduate School of Education, getting admitted, getting a master's degree from there, going on to teach um, in classrooms both in North Dakota and, and in Montana going on to policy level at the Office of Public Instruction and working for previous superintendents, and eventually um, leading to the opportunity to run for the superintendent of public instruction. And I can actually trace it back to that exact time. And you know, I think MSU was very supportive of those efforts once I received the fellowship, went through that process. Um, I sort of bloomed after that in the department and became, I was the secondary education student of the year. Uh, I was invited to speak at the, com the Founders Day convocation at MSU and those types of experiences that this college um, and this university allowed me to have, those leadership experiences actually um, helped me create this path and walk through the doors of opportunity that presented themselves. And so I'm just very thankful and I sort of feel like I've come full circle in watching um, a new president come on board that, that I'm very hopeful for transforming the future. So thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, President Nellis, as, we've, as we talked, you talked about being a Libby logger and I'm a Haver Blue Pony and we have a Shoto Bulldog and some <laughs> others that are at the table. Um, but, but the story that you related about your experience, um, I would like you to share that with Yeah, with thank you. And, and let me first say what an honor it is to be back here at Montana State University. I'm so proud of this university and so proud of today uh, with the installation of uh, President Cruzado. I think she's not only an outstanding leader, but she's going to be, as we look to the future, a great leader for Montana State University. And I couldn't be more proud uh, to be back here today. Um, as Kurt said, Kirk said, I, I uh, grew up in Libby, Montana, and uh, uh, my family really valued education and encouraged me to uh, come to Montana State University, and uh, this was transformative, coming to this university, um, and it really shaped the rest of my life, my career. Um, the values that I gained here, it was like, it, you know, you've heard this expression before, but like a light bulb coming on. The fascination for learning, <coughs> Uh, for discovery, uh, the, the self-confidence that, that this university 
helped me gain uh, was tremendous. And uh, the skills that I have, uh, my analytical skills, critical thinking skills, the communication skills, those were all shaped at this university. And I'm so proud of the quality of educational experience uh, that I had here. Um, again, coming from Libby, uh, uh, nothing wrong with Libby, Montana, except for some of the issues that they've had with the governor, I'm sure so very familiar with, and many of you. But, uh, but it was a, you know, a, a typical small town high school experience. But, but coming to this university and, and the opportunity to meet with, to interact with quality faculty who were very student-centered, and I could tell that they cared deeply about my welfare. Uh, my advisor uh, shaped my career and encouraged me to go on to graduate school. Uh, this was a place where I met my wife, uh, who's here today, also a Montana State alum. Uh, we both have degrees in earth sciences, uh, married now 35 years. but. That was a wonderful, again, uh, opportunity for me to meet her, and, uh, and of course she, to, as my partner, has, has helped uh, with my leadership uh, as we've uh, moved forward through the opportunities that we've had. But uh, again, this university, uh, I, I remember fondly uh, the classes from history to earth sciences to mathematics. Uh, ecology, I remember people like Don Collins teaching an uh, ecology class. I think there were, I don't know, 400 students it seemed like in uh, his lectures, but it was amazing. And, it, and uh, the dynamics of that and the, and the faculty like uh, uh, Dr. Bradley and Montaigne and Chadwick and, and Bob Taylor, who I, I understand just recently passed away, and Jim Eady, Joe Ashley, those people in earth sciences were tremendous. Uh, and very supportive in, in creating the, the, the uh, skills that I feel set the framework uh, for the rest of my career. And what, what really came out of all of that, I think, was that I never wanted to leave the university environment. <laughs> you know, I just, uh, this, was, this was the environment that I wanted to be part of for the rest of my life. And, uh, and so uh, I appreciated the opportunity that the university created for me. Wow, wonderful. I'm going to change up uh, the question just a little bit. And Governor Schweitzer, thank you so much for being with us today and helping to celebrate this great event um, at your um, institution uh, and school. So just changing it up, I'd, I'd like you to tell us about a time in your career um, that really was a turning point in your development as a leader and, and share that with us. I grew up in the Judith Basin, about halfway between Geyser and Rainsford. And when I was a freshman in high school, I uh, went out for the football team. Because you see in Geyser, if all the boys didn't go out for the football team, there wouldn't be a football team. <laughs> so as a freshman, I was about the size of Wadette, but I was on the football team. And we played eight-man football, and there were 12 of us on the team. And so all during August, of course, we were harvesting grain, so you'd get off the combine and you'd go in and practice, and then back to maybe baling some hay. But it was a busy time, but I made it to practice. Now, it was pretty clear to everybody that I wasn't going to be a starter, most of all to me. Now, I had pretty good hands, and so they said, well, we'll make you into a receiver. Well, I was good. I could catch the ball, but I was just hoping no one, you know, would ever catch me. And so we had our very first game, and it's on the calendar. The Geyser Wranglers were to play the Belt Huskies. Now, we're both Class C teams, but the difference between the Geyser Wranglers and the belt Huskies is, is oh, honest to God, that's like the difference between Drake playing Notre Dame. We knew that the result would be bad, we just hoped we were able to get through the game. So one week before the game with the belt Huskies, our senior quarterback went down. And now we're at 11. And the coach turned with a great deal of confidence to the fullback and said, now you'll be the quarterback. So he practiced as quarterback, and we were all optimistic that we'd make it through. And we get to the game, and it started out, it just couldn't have started better. Uh, we won the flip. And <laughs> we, we elected to receive. And of course, uh, so this kid, he had to bend 6'5", who was kicking off, kicked it all the way in the end zone. So we got the ball on the 20-yard line. So our senior quarterback, the leader of the 11 of us, me on the bench, he, uh, he calls a play. And it's a pretty simple play to get things started. He says, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll hand it to the halfback, and so it'll be on hut, hut, and I'll take one step back, I'll hand it to the halfback, and he'll go right over the guard. Good, break. 
They go to the line. Hut, hut. He takes half a step back. He's crushed by the belt huskies. He's laying there in a pile with a broken collarbone. So everything shut down for about 40 minutes till they got an ambulance out from Great Falls and took him off, and we're down to 10. <laughs> and uh, I really hadn't given much thought what comes next, and uh, the coach said, Schweitzer, to the bench. Well, there's really not a bench. There were just two of us. <laughs> Confused, I went over to the coach, and he put his arm around me, and he said, you're going in at quarterback. Really? <laughs> so in I trotted. And while the Belt Huskies were approximately double the size of everybody on our team, I got into the huddle and I looked up at all of the people on our team, the other seven, and they were looking down at me. And uh, they were hoping for the best. And so I had ticked through all the plays that I might call. And I knew that one step back was too much. And so <laughs> I called a play where I handed it off one half a step. And so, and oh, and it was just one hut too. So I go, hut, and I turn a quarter step, and they crush me. <laughs> now, we're on our own 10-yard line, and it's third and 20, and I go back to the huddle, and I'm looking at the rest of the team, and they're looking down at me, and they're looking for a spark of leadership. They're thinking, I don't know how we get our way out of this, but he's the one who's got to lead us. And as I'm gazing into their eyes and I'm seeing fear, I'm thinking to myself, this is a moment of leadership. Here is an opportunity for me to prove myself. So I did what every great leader did in that circumstance. I said, anybody got any ideas? <laughs> well, <laughs> we didn't make it to second half. They had a, they had a rule, you know, at something like 45 to nothing uh, that you didn't play the fourth quarter. But I say that in jest, but every great leader is a good listener. And when you surround yourself with people who will be honest with you, people who will talk you off a ledge. I like young people working for me. I like young people who still have that quest, who came there because they want to change the world. And I want them to challenge the status quo. I want them to ask, why not? How come? What if? And then I want some seasoned folks around to talk us all off the ledge. Because I have a lot of ideas. My wife is here. She, she's a grad, graduate of Montana State University in botany. I don't think they even have a botany graduate here anymore. And by the way, I, my master's is in soil science. And I'm pretty sure you can't get a master's in soil science at Montana State University. You call it something else. Environmental sciences, I don't know what it is. But the point is, surround yourself with critical thinkers. Surround yourself with young people who want to change the world. And then get some seasoned people that say, yeah, maybe we ought to do that next week. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. We're certainly glad that you got back up off the pile and, and have that, done what, you, what you're doing now. Uh, Dr. Saylor, uh, there is a turning point for you. We'd, I'd like to hear about that. Yeah. Well, this is, this is cruel business, having to follow the Governor, I tell you. Um, let me start by following suit and saying what an honor, first of all, it is for me to be back at MSU, um, and particularly for the inauguration of Dr. Cresato. It's truly an honor. Okay, so there was a turning point um, in, in my career. It was in the year 1997. I'm surprised, actually, that I don't remember the exact date. I probably could if I thought about it long enough. Um, but it was the day I decided to quit my job. Um, the circumstance was the following. We were starting up an automotive plant in Cullman, Alabama. If any of you have been to Cullman, Alabama, you have to get the visual in your mind, Dry County. Um, a little bit north of Birmingham. And um, this plant was an automotive plant we were starting up to service Mercedes-Benz, who had just moved to open their first automotive plant in the United States in Tuscaloosa. So this was a very stressful time for our company. My position at the time was training specialist, so my responsibility was to hire and train all of these local Alabama employees to produce automotive parts for just-in-time, just-in-sequence, delivery to Mercedes. So to cut to the chase, I was catapulted into a what I would call a cultural um, warfare. We had many Germans, engineers, and technicians flying into the dry county of Coleman, Alabama <laughs> for the startup of this automotive plant. I was trying to hire local Coleman um, employees to be trained um, and to produce these parts. And 
suffice it to say, it was the worst, seriously, it was the worst experience of my, of my life. Um, was not used at all to the German culture, to the German management style, to the German communication style. It was rough. Um, nothing we did was good enough. No one was competent. Myself, at the top of the list, what a woman was doing in this business in the first place was beyond any of their imagination. Um, so after a week of sort of 12, 14, 16 hour days of criticism and hearing that nothing you're doing is right, I said, this isn't where I want to be. You know, I want to be back like at Montana State University where people think you're kind of smart and <laughs> competent and they appreciate what you're doing. And I said, this isn't really the place for me. It's a little, little tough. Um, and I remember as if it were yesterday, going to my hotel room and thinking, okay, I'll resign tomorrow. And then I got up the next morning and looked in the mirror and said, no, I, sh I shouldn't do that. I should, I should hang in here. I should learn how to cope, um, not take all this criticism personally. Some of it was not justified, but some of it was. Um, and so that was a real turning point for me um, because that's when I said, don't quit. And I think that's an important leadership um, characteristic or trait is when it gets tough, don't run. Stay with your people. Absolutely, thank you. So, when we talked, President Nellis, a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was just very intrigued by leadership qualities um, that you talked about in great detail. And so, what I'm hoping, panelists, is that um, President Nellis will outline some qualities um, that bring into the room the, the great things that leaders do and that we would all engage in that conversation. So, President Nellis, if you would get us started in some leadership qualities. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, just to name a few, uh, among I have kind of 10 areas where I try to focus uh, relative to my own practice rel uh, with regard to leadership, but also uh, what I, I hope that uh, w will be reflected in the leaders of of the University of Idaho or what I see in others. But one of the, one, one key thing for me is, uh, in leadership quality is passion. And in the context of passion, uh, you know, when I get up every day, there are a lot of challenges being president of a, of a land grant uh, university. But, uh, but I look at it as an opportunity. And uh, I have the opportunity to work with very talented faculty. I have, I have uh, eager students, uh, great staff, people that care about the university, and I feel fortunate to have that opportunity. So having a passion, and again, that was instilled here at Montana State that I've tried to carry through my career. I truly love what I do. And, uh, and in that context, I, I, I believe in what I call constructive engagement. And I'm a person that likes to focus on the, the part of the glass that's half full, not half empty. And, you know, sometimes with the budget challenges we've had throughout the United States in the last few years, uh, we've had to shrink that glass a little bit. But, but at the same time, uh, uh, I like to focus on what opportunities and have a can-do can -do attitude. Look at challenges and try to turn them into opportunity. So that's one, that passion, constructive engagement. Another that I feel strongly about is, is being respectful of everyone in the organization as a leader. Uh, whether it's the custodian, whether it's the groundskeeper, whether it's the, uh, my executive assistant, the faculty, the sta staff, whatever role they play, uh, student leadership, whatever, it's very important that I be a good listener, that I, that I reflect, and it's in my heart, that I care about them and what the, the role that they play at the university. And I think that is true at this great university, that it's, you know, we, I, this institution has great faculty but it's all of these people working together. And, and, and as, as a leader, I want to reflect that in the way in which I interact with those people. And then a third, uh, and then I'll let uh, the other panelists uh, reflect on, on other qualities as well, would be being strategic and recognize that, you know, I think people get frustrated when, when leaders have ideas, but nothing ever seems to come out of that. And so reflecting strategically, uh, gathering input from a lot of different perspectives, but being very outcomes oriented. And uh, so I think that's another important quality. And there, there are many others, but uh, those are three that I'd like to share with you today. Thank you. Governor Schweitzer, you have some comments around characteristics and qualities? <clears throat> nobody, nobody that works for you ought to care more and work harder than you do. 
And all of the people under you, all the people that you work with, they ought to recognize that you're a scrapper, that you'll never give in, you'll never give up, and you'll be the first one to work and the last one to leave. My first job after leaving MSU was in Saudi Arabia. Actually, I did, I did a stint in Libya for about six months. I'm an irrigation specialist. And this uh, plan that they had was ambitious. It was a Swedish company that got a contract with the oldest son of the king, and they were to build the world's largest dairy farm 60 miles south of Riyadh in the desert. We t flew 25,000 head of cattle in, in 747s. The management team, about 60 strong, were all European. Swedish, Norwegian, some English, some Irish, and one American, the 24-year-old soil scientist who was responsible for drilling all the wells and growing all the crops to feed these 25,000 head of cattle. Uh, so while most of the management meetings were in Swedish, they were supposed to be in English so everybody could understand, I had to learn a little Swedish. And since I was the only American on the project, all of the butta jokes were about the Americans. And I was the youngest person on that project. But after six months, they recognized that he worked harder, he had smarter ideas, and he would get things done that he said he would get done. And that's how you earn the respect of the people around you. Great leaders are good workers and critical thinkers. Thank you. Dr. Saylor. Yeah, <clears throat> fully agreed with the comments so far on, on leadership qualities. Two, two additional ones come to my mind. Um, and one is uh, being a role model. I think that we always have to keep in mind that if you find yourself somehow in a position of leadership, you should never forget that people are looking at you all the time um, as a role model. So certainly the comments from the governor that you need to be rolling up your sleeves and doing what you're asking your people to do. Second, I'm admittedly somewhat biased on this topic, but I will mention communication. I think that um, communication, communication, communication is absolutely critical in positions of leadership. When I think about what I do when I go to work in the morning, from the time I get there to the time I go home, it's communicating. Whether that's in a meeting or on the phone or on a video conference or with employees or colleagues or members of a university or members of the community, um, face to face, it's all about communication. And every time you're communicating, you are somehow exerting, <clears throat> pardon me, your leadership, bad or good. And in the world as it is today, becoming more and more international, more and more global, I think that for people considering, um, aspiring to positions of leadership, you need to think about communication because I think it's becoming exceedingly more difficult to succeed. Um, it, and, and I don't always myself, trust me, I have my failures, but I think at least um, leaders should go in with an appreciation of the importance of effective communication. Absolutely. Superintendent Juno, I have sure. some qualities. What do you um, think? I guess, as I was thinking, I agree with everything that's been said, of course, except maybe that working harder thing. <laughs> yeah. <Just kidding. laughs> um, but I do, uh, since I've been in this position probably uh, in January, it will be two years. There really is an idea, and actually we discussed it at one point, about impatience. But impatience guided by optimism and hope about what can happen. We've been working with um, a few schools across the state that actually do need true reform. And the impatience around that and having a message that we will not stand idly by and let another generation fail in K-12 education um, and in those schools. And so an impatience. Um, Again, that, that's guided by this optimism that things can change, and things can change for the better, and the, and the future can be brighter f for people that you're working for, which, um, you know, of course, leads to a second part, is you should never forget who you work for. Um, and in this position, it is for the people of Montana, um, for the children of Montana, and we try to keep an eye on that in everything we do at the Office of Public Instruction. And remember that even though we look at data a lot and make data-driven decisions, and we're really big into that, that there are lives behind each of those data points. And a lot of those data points you know, are family and community members. And we must never forget that there are children behind all of that data. And so we really pay attention to that as well, um, remembering who we work for. And I think another thing that I've learned just in the last few couple years um, is 
we need to believe in those that we work with, and I think the governor spoke a little bit about this. Um, and, and you should work with them and be colleagues with them, even though you know, in, you're, you're in a superior position and in the boss. But I think it's very important to understand that you're working with people, you brought them on for a reason, you trust them to carry out um, your vision. And I think we had a little discussion about that, about how difficult that transition actually was going from a worker to you know, the top position in the agency and having to provide just the vision and trust others to carry that out. Um, and that's been a huge lesson for me since being in this position. So it's, it's a combination of things, but making sure that all of these are carried out. Huge job, um, particularly for leadership positions that are in the spotlight. I can tell you, Superintendent Juno, as a practicing educator here, that you have been able to make that transition to the visioning and, and you have surrounded yourself with, with people that are uh, making a difference in K-12 through education. I as, need a, that piece of the video for later. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, just wonderful things that are happening in K-12 as well as with our university system. You know, as we contemplate those qualities and the thought process, I think it was really important to get into the room that the various, the, con the constructive engagement and uh, all of the different things that, that you've mentioned. But one of the key elements that um, also has been a foundation for all of us as leaders is the foundation of mentorship. And who in your life, what in your life um, has made a difference there. And again, the richness of the stories as uh, we describe that. Um, Dr. Sale, I really would like you to talk a little bit about a key mentor or key mentors and how they influenced your development as a leader. Certainly. Um, it, it's hard to pick one or two names because I've been very fortunate to have um, a number of people in my life who have, have been a very positive influence. But um, if I have to pick, of course, I do the right thing and say my mother is first on the list. Every good girl does that, right? Um, but I say that with all, all sincerity. She has been the, the strongest influence in my life. She remains that to this day. Um, she's actually turning 90 next week, and she's in the audience. Hi, Mom. Still here. Hi, Mom. But not just because she taught me things, because, but she lived them. So I didn't just hear um, about certain values, but I actually saw them every day growing up. So first, mother. Um, but I want to mention two more because I think they're particularly relevant. And one was actually my academic advisor here at Montana State University. His name was Ray Weisenborn. I have two Rays in my life, Ray Weisenborn. And he was the person who really turned me on to this whole field of communication. I had no idea um, what I wanted to study. I thought at one time in high school, which I'll come back to, that I might be a music major. Probably a good decision because I wasn't really good enough, but that was sort of what the, the direction I was headed. But it was my academic advisor here at Montana State University that really generated this passion um, about this whole field of communication. And he was a tremendous influence um, on my life at that time. I was 20 years old um, and really encouraged me to go again outside my comfort zone um, and pursue graduate school, which I never would have done with, without him. Um, and then the second Ray was my academic advisor in my PhD program. And I mention these two people because I think um, teachers, whether it's in grade school or high school or university, are so totally influential on students, um, positively or negatively. And I just think it's very important that they understand every time they're in a the classroom, um, teaching or mentoring, that they're potentially influencing the direction of those students' lives. So I wanted to mention the two uh, academic advisors because those were very strong influences in, in my life in addition to my mother. And now I have to throw in one thing. In the days that I thought I might be a music major, um, a very important person in my life was Lloyd Reynolds, my music teacher in high school, who also happens to be sitting here. Wow. Surprise to me. So thank you, Lloyd, also in my future life, my former yeah. life, I mean. How wonderful. I, I continue to reflect as um, 
on my leadership and, and what has happened over the time. And I just have to tell you that I, I really believe that the most noble of professions is teaching. We affect the future, we affect the lives and what's gonna happen. And I know this room is filled with those who have benefited from um, an outstanding teacher. And there are outstanding teachers that are in the room here, and I just want to offer a word of thanks to those of you who continue to do that great job right here at Montana State University. I've benefited from that along the way as well. Um, and so thank you for what you've done. <laughs> Superintendent Juno, do you have a mentor? Yeah, and you know, I'm gonna also speak to family primarily and I think you know in the broad sense of family I can think back to growing up in Brownie Montana on a Blackfeet reservation and just you know it, it's different and coming to college and, and going out into the world and doing all sorts of things but it's those lessons you learn in your formative years um, that never go away and I can think back and, and my family is still teaching me things about leadership all the time um, I, uh, my paternal grandfather was a custodian and a bus driver and a truant officer for schools and you know broadening out the idea of um, te educators and, and how what kind of effect they have on the future and the people that they work with my paternal grandmother was a school cook for 28 years um, and the lessons that I was able to watch them go through life you know um, bringing up a huge family in poverty um, my parents um, believing in public education so much that you know they went and we g received their college degree from um, MSUB, then Eastern Montana College, um, and us moving back to Brownie, Montana, where I then went to grade school and all the way through high school graduation. And it's all of those ideas and the mentorships and the learning experiences and. Like I said, I'm still learning things. So I was at a conference recently, and a lady came up to me, and she told me how much my grandfather had meant to her, where she was growing up, and she was her and her brother were so poor they couldn't afford shoes. And as a truant officer, he went to her house, knocked on her door, and you know they said they could not go to school. And the next day, how he brought them shoes, and they were able to attend school, and continue their education. And that lady today is a teacher in the public education system. And it's those ideas of taking care of each other and those values of making sure that you're taking um, care of those around you so that they can succeed and putting that spotlight on them. Um, and, and so I guess in the large spectrum, you know, my folks were both public school educators. They were counselors and administrators and school board members and superintendents of schools. Um, and so it's also that big belief in public education, which actually made me want to be superintendent of public instruction when this position came open, because I believe so much in the power of public education and what it can do for individuals, for communities, and for this state and this nation um, by becoming educated and allowing people the opportunity and access to go on to higher education, receive degrees, and go out and improve communities, improve their families, um, and improve their own lives. And, and th so those are the lessons that I've learned, that there are, are big and bold leadership opportunities, you know, where the spotlight is, is, shines down on you and, and, you know, these kinds of positions. And then there's the quiet leadership, those people who work just very closely with people and make sure that people have shoes to get to school and make sure that you're knocking on the door and making sure students are getting to school and you're just whispering encouragement throughout um, a person's life to know, know that they can succeed as well. And so it, it's all of those types of ideas and, and I guess I would just go back to family, to my community and the types of lessons they taught me and how that's helped me develop leadership and the types of, hopefully, the types of visions that I bring to this position as well. You know, thank you so much. It's that unconditional belief and support, you know, of, of extended family right. and community that and, has. And I guess truly I'll just add on too. I remember running for this position. This is the first time. That, I mean, I read the governor's bio that I ever ran for anything as well. You know, I wasn't even student council leader in high school, and 
so jumping into this, this position and deciding to take a jump into politics was a new thing. My, my mother was the first American Indian woman to serve in the state senate, and so I was able to watch and learn from her leadership ability as well. And so talking about those influences of your mother and how they impact your lives. Um, but I remember Linda McCullough was termed out, and you know the position was wide open. And I talked with a few people about it, and everything kind of seemed to be a green light. And I called up my mom and my dad, and I said, I think I want to run for superintendent of public instruction. And they didn't say, uh, you're kind of crazy. Or <laughs> they, they basically took the unconditional support that they've always provided and said, all right, well, let's go. And they loaded up the car, and we drove all across the state to communities, big and small, and, and just really made a move, and we're, we were successful. And so it's that support as well that um, comes from community and family, so. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Governor Schweitzer, mentors along the way? Jerry Nielsen was my major professor here at Montana State University. And uh, for any of you who knew Jerry Nielsen, uh, and do know Jerry Nielsen, you know he's an optimist. Jerry was always looking at the next mountain that would be climbed. Now, the mountain behind that he had climbed, didn't talk about that. The mountain that did, he didn't get to the top of, he didn't talk about that. He talked about that mountain, the one in the future, an optimist. People don't follow people who are moaners and whiners and complainers. <laughs> people follow people who are optimists, who have a vision, who say we're going someplace together. Now, in my short time as governor, my uh, political opponents, they're always arguing about something we did last month. And they can never catch up because we finished that mountain and we're going to the next one. Never look in that rear view mirror. Look to the future. Climb the mountain. Jerry Nielsen was the greatest optimist I'll ever know, a great soil scientist, a great mentor in science, but his optimism has changed my life. Thank you, President Nellis. Do you have um, comments? My, my undergraduate advisor here was Joe Ashley, uh, who I think just recently retired, uh, spent a long time here in his career, but was just outstanding as far as being so caring and taking the time mentoring me, uh, preparing me uh, for my graduate work at Oregon State. Um, he took the extra time uh, to advise me and just that additional attention, um, that caring attitude. And, and we all know about how important retention is at universities. And so often it is making those connections with faculty, someone who really cares about the student's welfare. And this, this university, I think, practices that, practices that every day. But Joe was uh, characteristic of that. But I also, through the faculty that I experienced, not only in earth sciences, but across the university, I gained so much in mentoring me as far as the way in which I, my, the style that I used as a professor in my lectures. I gained different things from different faculty at uh, Montana State University. Uh, they, they, we had a lot of field experiences, uh, the opportunity to go out in the field and discover here, and what a great setting to do earth science laboratory work, a spectacular setting, but that discovery not only in the classroom but also outside the classroom that the faculty in earth sciences encouraged I think was an important part of mentoring me uh, for discovery and learning as I continued my career. Yeah, thank you. It, you know another topic I think that is really pertinent to our whole discussion here this morning is um, others, who you surround yourself with, um, the ability to surround yourself with those that carry the optimism and help move things forward. And I, I really believe that it would be great to get the stories from each of you about those that you're supporting and how you support them uh, so that they grow as leaders within your organization. And so, Superintendent Juno, I guess I'll start with you and we'll head straight down the line. Yeah, and I guess... Um so supporting others. Supporting others. Yes. And I'll just go back to the lesson I learned about um, running for this office as well. Running for office really isn't, you know, rocket science. You work harder than anybody else. <laughs> Maybe a little soil science. <laughs> um, three things you need. Time, money, and people. That's it. Um, and you work hard. One thing you can't get more of, time. And the most important person's time, the candidate. 
the leader uh, um, of the campaign or, or the position you're in. And so I think as far as supporting others in their leadership is finding time to support those who want access to power, who want access to um, provide you their vision and to visit with you. And it goes back to that idea of listening and how a good leader is a listener. But it's also, you know, making time for that as well. And then when you hear a good idea, shining light on that. When you see a great group of students, making sure they're recognized. Um, when you see people who are up and comers, that you take some time. And, you know, we have an intern in our office from Carroll College, fantastic. Um, member of the Blackfeet tribe and uh, is just really a go-getter and is interested in all kinds of leadership ideas. And so, you know, bringing her on as an intern, taking her around the state, introducing her to people, um, and making time for her leadership development as well. And so that idea of, of recognition, and, and you know, I know there's a group of leadership students here from Little Bighorn College. They have all been texting in the back, but if you guys would stand up. <laughs> 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 I say the future will be texted live. Yeah. So. <laughs> You're now on film, and that will be shared around the state. <laughs> President Ellis. Well, I wanted to share a, a, a couple of things that I've tried to do to mentor uh, people at the University of Idaho. One of those is to, I created a leadership academy, and that is uh, uh, designed around having uh, representatives from throughout the university community, so their staff as well as faculty and including administrators because really if, as you think about a university envi environment or any type of, of uh, organization or corporation there are leaders at every level and we practice whether again it's the executive assistant or the custodian their, le their leadership qualities that each of these uh, uh, bring to the university or the faculty so uh, this leadership academy we had the first uh, class uh, this last year uh, and they go through a series of programs. They meet once a week, and uh, and uh, it was, uh, I think, very successful. It also creates a sense of community across our organization, our campus, which has been very helpful. Uh, I have the opportunity to speak to this group a couple times during the uh, the semester that they have the academy, and uh, again, I think the product of that was very positive. Another thing that I think helped has helped mentor people as we. At me being a relatively new president, uh, I have a monthly what I call breakfast for progress, and we have different themes. And I bring department heads, uh, deans, uh, key directors of the university together uh, for these breakfasts for progress, uh, and uh, we have different themes. But I think uh, having the opportunity to have open dialogue around some of the critical issues uh, facing uh, the university. Uh, uh, and, uh, and coming to some sense of shared vision uh, certainly has helped uh, move uh, the institution forward and I think any organization forward. So creating these sorts of opportunities, even during a time when uh, you know, resources are, are limited, but I think it's so important uh, in an organization as, and as we mentor people that we carve out those opportunities, that those don't become one of the things that gets excluded as we face uh, more and more limited resources. But uh, those, again, are a couple of examples that we've tried to practice. Dr. Saylor, examples of your supporting others in their development? Sure. I think um, going back to a comment that Superintendent Juno mentioned is, is this issue of time. Um, we never seem to have enough of it, um, but we have to make the time for those around us because I learn every day that's what they want. They want your personal time. In the company that I work for, we have very formal um, leadership development programs in place. Those are internal as well as external, partnering with universities. We do foreign assignments abroad. Um, and that's all good and well. And um, I think they're very uh, productive programs and very well received. But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, people want one-on-one -on -one time with you. They want advice, they want guidance, and they want feedback. It comes back to communication again, not just when they're doing a good job or when the company's doing well, uh, but also when they're not. And I think children, students, 
employees all need to hear honest and direct feedback. That's what makes them better. And that takes time. That isn't a text message, sorry. It's not an email. It's not a, a voicemail message. That's still, to me, one-on-one -on -one communication um, and that mentoring. And that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges I face is in not getting so caught up in the day-to-day, -day, which can really suck you in. Um, and you can go home at 9 o'clock at night and realize you didn't meet with any of your employees all day long. Um, and that's, for me, one of, one of the biggest challenges. But uh, I think we should all, um, those of us in positions of leadership, remember that maybe at the forefront of our minds, our mission as life is to make our companies succeed or make our universities thrive or make your government succeed. Um, but running parallel should be the development of your employees. You should be simultaneously preparing those behind you to be even better leaders than, than we are. And that takes time. Thanks, Dr. Saylor. Governor Schweitzer. Do you remember your first grade teacher? Yes. Mine was Mrs. Richardson. <laughs> we had a rocky relationship. <laughs> Me in the corner, she at the front of the room. At the end of my first week at school, Geyser, there were nine of us in that classroom, and I came home and I said to my mother, I was the fourth of six, I said to my mother, what's this business about the steam and the sauna? Because you see, seven out of the nine kids were Finn in my class. And that's when my mother sat me down and she said, oh, we need to have a conversation. Not everybody's the same. And we come from a different background than a lot of the Finns. That was my first exposure to diversity. Now that's not a lot of diversity. They all had blue eyes too. <laughs> but I have learned that diversity is the wealth of life. If you surround yourself with people who look like you and were educated like you and dress like you and talk like you, well, you don't need the people around you. Bring new people in, new ideas. Now, I'm proud that during my administration, we have more Indian people working in my administration than all 22 governors combined before me. We've brought people in that are young. We've brought people in that are old. We've brought people in that don't look like us, don't talk like us, don't think like us, because we want a result that represents all of Montana. And that's one of the reasons that I am so excited that we are here celebrating a woman like Waded Cruzado, who doesn't look like my first grade class. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about a time of adversity or challenge, okay? Um, well, I want you just to think for a minute of challenge and define what that was for you and talk about how challenge became the opportunity to move things forward. And this is a little bit different than what we had talked about here, but we have the advantage of some time, and so I'd really like to get that in the room. Anybody have that just jumping at them right now? Governor? You've I'm the luckiest person that you'll ever meet. Everybody who knows me knows that it just kind of falls into place. And I've been good at a lot of things, surprising. Uh, but there's some things that I'm not good at and I'm learning every day. And one of which is um, we have two wars going on right now. And when a young man, and it has been all young men, it may be young women, when, when they return from war and their parents have told, been told that they won't, uh, they won't be in that family anymore, that they've given their all. I go to those funerals. I don't say anything. I don't talk to the press. They come around. I say, oh, this, this is celebrating a family. And I meet with the families, and I don't actually have the words to say. I say to them, because I, as you know, I lived in the Middle East and I didn't think it was a particularly good idea to go into Iraq. It didn't make any sense to me at the time, it doesn't now. Um, I'm not sure why we ever went to Afghanistan and why we're still there. But I don't say that to the parents. I say to them, thank you. And I say to them, I can't, I can't tell you why this happened in your family. But I know this, that you're hurting. And if I can help you in any way, not this week or next week or next month, even next year, and I hand them a small piece of paper that has my home phone number and my cell phone. 
I was at, I was at a funeral in southeast Montana, and I listened to a father, and he said to me, we didn't understand it when our son came to us after 9-11. His uncle had gone to Vietnam, and he came back, and it was never quite the same. And so it surprised us that he wanted to fight. But he said, if you won't sign these papers so that I can join the Marines, I'll wait till I'm 18 and I'll go on my own. So we supported him. And along the way, he got married and had two children. He served two terms. And then um, we're a long ways away from Billings, and we're a lot of dirt road. And so when the black suburban pulled up and two military officers, the dogs were barking, my wife looked out the window and she just collapsed. He said, I went to the door, they told me. And we couldn't leave the house for a couple of days. Finally, on the third day, he said, you know, I think better when I get in my pickup and I just drive the ranch. And so I went out and he said, Governor, this is gonna sound crazy to you, but just hear me out. Went out, I went through the first gate, went about a section, got out, next gate. Third gate, I got to got out, drove through it, closed the gate, and I got back in, and there was my son, just like it used to be. And he said, Dad, don't worry about me. I did what I wanted to do. I lived my dream. But I want my kids to be ranchers like you. Now, <laughs> it's times like that that a good leader says nothing. Just listen and learn the lesson. Wow. I'm not following him. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, again, that is hard to follow for sure. Uh, a little bit different theme, though, and it, it came up uh, briefly last night, too, uh, and Peter McGraw, I think, uh, addressed the question. I guess one of the biggest uh, challenges I've had in uh, my first year as president, and even before that, when I was at Kansas State as provost and vice president related to the, you know, the economic crisis that we've been through the last uh, few years, the challenges associated with that. In, in the state of Idaho, uh, we've, uh, the University of Idaho, we've taken uh, around 23% cuts in our state appropriations the last two years in total. And we're surrounded by states that are even worse than that as far as if you look west to Washington and California, Oregon. Um, and it's, but it's this whole, this whole trend, this challenge of communicating the message that is so important about the value of higher education in our country. You know, the Morrill Act, I had a chance to see that last night, and the significance of that in this country, um, really the democratization of higher education and the impact that's, at, that's had on the United States is extraordinary. The impact of Montana State University as a land-grant institution this institution is part of the fabric of this state. It's part of the history of this state since its beginning. With extension offices, the research centers around the state, the distributed campuses around this state, the graduates of this university, it's extraordinary. And it's that, that story that Montana State is illustrative of that we see nationally with our land-grant institutions. At the same time, we've had this disinvestment in higher education at a time when um, we're losing our edge as far as global competitiveness. Now in the United States we have a very competitive spirit and I remain optimistic about where we can be but I do believe universities like Montana State and the University of Idaho are part of a successful future, a part of American competitiveness as we look to the future and uh, very very important. So those challenges of communicating the frustration has been this disinvestment. But at the same time, I'm a can-do type person. I like to look at those challenges and turn them into opportunities. And we're trying to be more entrepreneurial and to think differently about the way we do business. You know, we're trying to do more partnerships with industry, but it needs to be done carefully and in ways that continue to elevate the university and the state. And I think that's true here at Montana State. But this whole disinvestment is very, uh, troubling to me and it's been a challenge as I've faced personally how to communicate more effective to the public uh, about the value of higher education. And again, Montana State is a critical part of this state's competitiveness. It's critical to the future as far as economic development and quality of life of this state. And I feel very passionately about that. 
I guess I would just say the biggest lesson that I've learned that is both a challenge and a benefit is the idea that people are watching. People are watching leaders in this state. They pay attention uh, more than I thought they were actually. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, you know, I came into this position being an educator and um, a teacher and working at the agency and kind of understanding that business and had some ideas about how public education could be on a cycle of continuous improvement and always become better um, to look at data and move issues forward and meet those challenges head on. What I didn't know so much about were land board issues. Um, the governor and I sit on a land board that oversees a lot of state land in the state and you know we have a duty to create a system where we're getting money off of that land that goes to schools and um, so I've learned a lot around timber and natural resources and oil and you know all kinds of issues that I didn't think I was like well, I was sitting on them like I, I should have taken those environmental law classes actually <laughs> when I was in law school but um, and the biggest I guess where I learned a lot uh, that people were watching was on this Otter Creek boat. And we had to make a decision on the land board whether to dig up a bunch of coal in southeast Montana. I had to um, take a different stand than my peers on the land board. Um, I was the sole lone vote on the first time, voting no, that I didn't think that we should do that. Um, and that was hard. It was really, really difficult, politically difficult. Um, Friendship-wise, difficult. Uh, the idea of um, who I oversee as, as superintendent of public instruction and where money goes, difficult. Um, but I think it is that idea that when you come to where, wherever you're sitting, whether it's on a panel, whether it's on a land board, whether it's in a political seat, that you bring your principles and values with you. And you should never shed those. And so I guess when that decision came around and you stick to your guns and you do what you think is right so you can look at yourself the next day in the mirror. That's where I'm from. Um, and you let the chips fall where, where they may. And, but I think people can respect that as long as you know where that person stands that you're supporting and who you are as a person um, that even though you may disagree with them, you can respect the position that they're coming from. And that we had also a discussion, Larry Baker and I, last night a little bit about how our country is moving forward in a very divisive way and how we don't have room or space or time for these types of different types of discussions and disagreements with each other and how we need to take that kind of um, intellectual curiosity and allow disagreements to happen but do it in a respectful way. And the place, the only place that can occur in today's society are you the university systems and colleges. And we should allow that type of um, discussion to happen so that we understand other people's points of view, um, that we know where people are coming from, and we know the types of values and principles and backgrounds that make up people's decisions. And I think that's vitally important. And, and you know, I think university systems are the place to do that still. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a whole spectrum, but I, th I guess what I've learned and then the biggest challenge was, of course, it was amazing how much that vote meant to Montana on both sides. Um, and, and I guess the realization that people are really, really, they are paying attention and they care about Montana one way or the other. And they care about the type of money that's coming in or they care about the environment and just how much people care and, and are paying attention. And, and I was just really thankful for, you know, being able to have that experience of, of um, having to take a stand on my beliefs despite um, others um, in, in, in that effort, so. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Saylor, do you? Oh, this is probably gonna sound a lot less profound than my colleagues' comments, but I, when you asked the question, a particular incident came to mind. Um, so now we'll get back to, to a business example. Um, I told the story about 1997 when I decided to quit my job and then decided not to, so, which was absolutely the right decision. I'm still with the same company and CEO of that company. Um, but So I worked my way through the organization and ended up in um, 2006 as Vice President of Human Resources, and then in 2006 was appointed CEO. 
And I thought, this is so cool, because I don't think I actually have to do anything anymore. Like, what does a CEO do? Like, okay, so like, I have all these vice presidents, and I just have to sort of make sure that they do their jobs, right? So this was a very exciting moment for me, um, which was very short-lived, I might say, because we are, uh, our company is in the construction and the automotive uh, business. So uh, those of you I'm sure familiar with those industries will remember in 2000, middle of 2008, was the perfect storm. They both crashed. Um, and so my company, as well as many other companies, went through some very, very difficult times, had to take very drastic measures uh, to get ourselves back on course. And part of those drastic measures that we, like many other companies, had to go through was letting, off, uh, letting employees go, which is always the worst uh, scenario imaginable. We're a private, family-owned company, and I let employees go that had been with us 25, 30, and 40 years, and I know their families, and I knew their children. So very difficult time. But part of that exercise was also letting um, half of my management board go, which is the right thing to do. You can't just let your receptionist go. You have to cut at the top as well. So I had an eight-member management board that from one day to the next became four. So what do you do? Uh, we had a little discussion last night about doing um, you know, more with less, and I know all about that, uh, because I had to take on some of those functions myself. So I not only suddenly was the CEO, but I was the acting vice president of construction, of quality, of supply chain management, of purchasing, of our Rayhaw Academy, um, and of corporate communications. So even as I sit here today, I have 26 direct reports, which if you read any management book, it's not, it's not a good thing, trust me. Um, but so that was a bit the shock that this glamorous CEO position, it, trust me, is not, not so glamorous. You never feel like you're ahead of the game. Um, but the, the benefit of that is I think I'm a better one because it really required me to dig in, understand those functions, do some of the responsibilities, um, and share in those responsibilities, the actual completion of tasks. Um, so I think uh, wasn't the way I had anticipated things went, wasn't the way I would have chosen for them to go, but I think in the end it's made me certainly a more well-rounded CEO, a stronger one. I do uh, agree with you. I wish I would have paid more attention in chemistry um, <laughs> and math and all the other classes that I didn't. But uh, anyway, the positive outcome in the end. Excellent, excellent comments. You know, our, our time is, is coming close to an end. And so in our last five minutes here, um, we've, we've walked a path uh, that has looked at qualities and mentors and adversity and challenges and opportunities. I'd like each of you to um, just think for a moment and then share with us one piece of advice that you would give to those that are present with us and that will be viewing this uh, in the future one piece of advice that you would give to them as they pursue a leadership position or leadership qualities. So, Governor, let's start with you. You know, a recent study said that uh, the fun kids go to the University of Montana and the smart kids go to Montana State University. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm outraged by those comments because I thought I was a fun kid. <laughs> I think it's Im important uh, to recognize that um, the world's changing very fast. That uh, this generation, this generation that we have in our classrooms today, uh, they, they grew up in a digital generation. Uh, they communicate in a digital way. And if our university system, if our university system continues to educate in the same way that we did for the last 40 years, we're going to lose a generation. We need distance learning. We need to reach people where they're at real time. We need to get the classroom to the student, and that student might be a mother. She may be a blue-collar worker. She may be a president of a university someplace else. We need an education system that is relevant, that's real time, and gets to the student wherever they're at. And if we don't get it right at Montana State University, they'll get it right in Idaho, or they'll get it right in the University of Montana, or they'll get it right at Northern Arizona University where over half of their students are getting their curriculum by distance learning. So we gotta move pretty quick. It's a competitive world. 
And uh, as you all know, if you're going to stay on top, you've got to bring on the new technology. That's the challenge for the people in the room here today. Let's be the leaders, not the followers. Thank you. President Nouns? Well, again, uh, I, th those are great comments, Governor, but, and, and, I, and I truly believe uh, what you've said. And I think with that, the, the passion, uh, I guess, again, I've said this before, but I think we all need to do what we're passionate about. Uh, with, with young people coming up, sometimes they get caught up in what's going to make the most money for me instead of what they're really passionate about. And I think sometimes they get frustrated with their career paths because they don't do what's really in their heart. And one of the things I learned at this institution, because I started out in a different major that I ended up in, like a lot of students, uh, but is, is to do what, what I'm passionate about. And once I made that decision, it was amazing what, what I was able to accomplish. And I think that's really a leadership quality that we need to instill. And I think if we're passionate about what the governor suggested, which, again, a lot of people are looking at new ways of delivery. You know, the students today are very different from the students when I was in the classroom uh, the, or, or when I was teaching as a professor, the way in which we interact, a very different environment. Uh, so we have many opportunities to share that passion, but I think it's truly living that passion doing what you care about, being optimistic, and I, I think if you do that, uh, we can change the world. And we, we've done that in the past here in Montana and, and in the United States, and I think we need to continue to live that. Thank you very much. Dr. Salem. Yeah, my parting piece of advice to people seeking positions of leadership would be to make sure you want them for the right reason. And what I mean by that is that positions of leadership are not the same as being a leader. So with, with being a good leader comes a responsibility. It, you, that responsibility to be a role model, to develop people behind you, to leave a lasting and positive impact on those, in fact, who you're leading. Lots of people can get into positions of leadership. They do it every day, and it's not particularly complicated. There are many ways to do that. That doesn't make them good leaders. There are lots of bad leaders in positions of leadership. We all know who they are. Um, or maybe we don't, I don't know. <laughs> but that's my advice, is to really think about what it means to not say, I aspire to be a CEO, or I aspire to be a governor, or I aspire to be a superintendent or a president of a university. It, it's not about that. You should aspire to be the good leader. Leadership is not a position. Leadership is an action. Thank you. And I guess word? I would just, yes, bounce a little bit off of that and just circle back, actually, to the beginning of my discussion about um, taking advantage of opportunities as they present themselves. That's been my entire series of, of doors opening and walking through those um, to get to where I am. You know, it wasn't planned. Um, I didn't have a grand scheme to get where I am. It was just a series of opportunities and, and you know, taking advantage of, of um, the door opening, of seeing who was around you and, and if they, whether they were, if they were supporting you to use their skills to help you get better and to constantly learn and to move forward in a way that you know you're always learning something new and then you know once you get to a position of leadership and and discover where you are not to take yourself so seriously um, you know, I still wake up at night kind of laughing to myself that I'm the superintendent of public <laughs> instruction. It's, um, it's been an amazing ride, um, and I, I still am amazed by um, people's support and helping me to get where I am and all the doors that did open. And they opened to me because of public education, and they opened to me because of MSU. And the, and the opportunities that I was able to take advantage of coming out of this university. And, you know, late at night I sit there and um, as I'm still working at midnight, Governor, and <laughs> think about the, just the opportunities I've been able to have, you know, flying over the Rocky Mountain front and sitting with the Governor and hanging out with him once a month and, and seeing a lot of other powerful people in the state and working with the legislature. We have legislators here of, of moving policy forward in this state and how vitally important all these positions are and being able to do what I do of visiting schools all across the state and meeting new leaders and talking with the future of our state about where they want to go. 
amazing, amazing experiences. Um, got to meet the President of the United States when he was in Montana. Got to hang out with the Secretary of Education for the country. And you know, I reflect back and I sit there and I was like, this is not bad for a Browning High School graduate. Um, and so I'm just really honored to, again, be a part of this. So take advantage of opportunities, and when you get there, um, don't take yourself so seriously. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to acknowledge the audience today um, because I believe that you have created gracious space, even in the formalness of what his, has been here, and you've allowed the diversity of views to enter the room uh, and share the stories, the richness of the stories that are here. And quite frankly, the goal was, can we learn in public as a result of that? And so m my great hope moderating this panel was that um, gracious space happened, and I believe that it did, that the richness of stories got diversity of voices into the room, and that each of you were able to pick something up and learn in public from our great panelists. And would you please join me in uh, recognizing Governor Schweitzer, President Nellis, Dr. Saylor, and Superintendent Juno for sharing your wisdom today. Thank you. Thank you. So, just just a moment, Governor. I've, so before. Before we leave this morning. I would just say a big round of applause for our moderator, yeah. Kirk Miller. Thank you, I've been giddy with excitement to get your voices <laughs> into the room for a couple of weeks. Before we depart today, um, I wanna turn our attention to Dr. Crisado. And you know, in moments, the focus is gonna be upon your leadership. And it's a moment in time and you're, you, have, you have tried diligently over the, your time here to help us focus and celebrate on the university and on the students that are a part of that university. And I can tell you, you have accomplished that. I want to thank you for living the wisdom and the qualities and the mentorship and all of the items that w were placed on the table today. And I want to also acknowledge the fact that I believe you have our collective support the empowerment of the university community to assist you at Montana State University, our land-grant university, to transform the world, and we wish you the best.